Uh, for our third speaker today, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Nadine Mabur, who is uh, the director of the Arab American Cultural Center and professor here at UIC, um, a collaborator for this symposium. So, Dr. Nadine. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to Mark and Art, Mark and Art, for <laughs> organizing this awesome event. So I'm going to be introducing Leila Abdelazak. She's a Chicago-born Palestinian author and artist. Her debut graphic novel, Badawi, published by Just World Book 2015, was shortlisted for the 2015 Palestine Book Awards. Her creative work primarily explores issues related to diaspora, refugees, history, memory, and borders. Layla has been involved in organi organizing around the Palestinian cause and the city of Chicago since 2011. She's currently a core member of For the People Artist Collective. She's also the founder of Big Mouth Press and Comics. And I just wanted to make a couple comments that, to me, Layla is one of the most fierce people I know. She, um, the work she does takes a lot of courage and strength um, because the issues around being the type of artist she is that represents Palestinian struggle and Arab diaspora struggles is a, are movements that are under extreme attack and she has no fear and I'm so inspired by her all the time. I really, really am so inspired by her. And also I think she's a model of what it means to have uh, art as a central component of grassroots movements, not only as a side note, but um, as part of the way we Kind of develop our political consciousness and how we organize and what we dream about, what we think about, and what we want, and also just building strength for people. And I, that happens through the artwork that she does for so many people, not only in the U.S. but in Palestine. So let's welcome Leila to UIC. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk today about um, a few different things about my work. Some of the um, techniques or methods I use to try and um, shape or push the narrative around Palestine um, and representations of Arabs and Palestinians and Muslims in general. Um, and so I'm going to start by talking about my graphic novel, The Dawi. Um, when I first started writing this graphic novel, actually when I first started working on this project, I didn't even mean to write a graphic novel. Um, I was doing it as a webcomic. And it kind of came out of um, this realization that um, well, my dad's story, so my dad uh, grew up uh, in a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, and I'll get into the history around that as I tell a little bit more of the story behind this um, project. But um, originally, I started working on the webcomic because I came to this realization at some point that, um, well, a lot of the stories that I was writing about or interested in telling were very common within Palestinian communities. They were not as commonly heard outside of those communities. Um, and I saw this kind of like individual storytelling as a way to kind of engage people in Palestinian issues because a lot of times even if you say I'm Palestinian that immediately elicits a response from someone like you can't be non like you can't be Palestinian and not be political people politicize you you don't have a choice um, and so um, a lot of times like people have a very uh, adverse reaction to just even saying you're Palestinian or something like that and so for me, um, telling these stories was a way to kind of help people understand a little bit more about our histories, um, what we're facing, what we're dealing with, um, and to understand more about the Palestinian struggle and um, uh, understand more about um, uh, our what, what we're fighting for and what we're up against through these personal stories. Um, so just to give a bit of background, if I um, so the first stories I did were really simple. They weren't even like super political. The first one I did was about playing marbles in the camp. Um, and like I said, it was just little short anecdotes, comic anecdotes that I was posting online to a blog and posting to my Facebook and sharing with people stories from my dad's childhood. Um, and as these were circulating online and people were sharing them, um, and I was posting more and more, eventually um, this publishing company just wrote books reached out to me and they were like, hey, we really like what you're doing, do you want to make this into a graphic novel? And so being like 19 and having no graphic novel writing experience or anything like that, I was like, yeah, definitely I want to make this into a graphic novel. And then I was like, whoa, I'm way in over my head. Um, it took me about three years to finish it. Um, I was in school at the time and um, doing other things. Um, 
But uh, the story ended up, you know, I started thinking about, okay, how do I take all these individualized anecdotes and create an arc, create like a larger story, create a story that will help people understand something about the Palestinian struggle, about the right of return, through these individual anecdotes. How do I make it into one cohesive story? Um, and so I started trying to kind of do more intentional research, interviewing my dad about specific incidents, because I started with the kinds of stories that your parents tell you over and over again, and you're like, stop telling me that story. I get the picture, <laughs> like you repeat it every week to like make this point. I like, you know, you don't need to do that. Um, so it started with those kinds of stories, and then as I was working on the book, um, I was kind of trying to think more intentionally about like, which kinds of stories I was including um, how I was going to position them within like the political and historical context and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of the, um, well just for background, um, so I mentioned that my dad grew up in a Palestinian refugee camp. Um, for me part of telling this story is also to contextualize it and help people understand why that's the case. Um, so in 1948, um, with the creation of the State of Israel, the Israeli army went into what was historic Palestine, Palestinian villages all over the place, and began ethnically cleansing Palestine and committing massacres in different villages. And my family's village was called Safsaf. It was located in the north of the country, um, right near the border with Lebanon. And on October 30th, 1948, the Israeli army came into the village and committed a massacre. At the time, my grandfather was um, working as a postman, so he was not in the village. Had he been in the village, he could have been killed. They lined up all the men and shot them execution style. Um, my grandmother survived this massacre, and when my grandfather came back um, from his work, they left um, and went to Lebanon, to this refugee camp. And that's how my family ended up in that, in that camp. And it's important to note that like, when Palestinians left at this time, it wasn't like, people thought they were going to be able to go back. Like people, my grandparents didn't bring a lot of their valuables. People thought, okay, this is really bad, but like we're going to go back and like this is just, this will get better. But today, over 70 years later, my family still lives in that refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, and so um, these stories, it was very important to me when I was writing the story to contextualize all of that because Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are treated very badly. Palestinian refugees don't have citizenship can't own land, can't like work most jobs, so there's a lot of systematic um, repression towards Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, but I wanted people reading the story to understand the context of why, are, why is my family in this situation. It's because of Israel and it's because of the creation of Israel on top of Palestinian land. And to this day, Palestinian refugees are not allowed to return to our villages. Um, and that's, that's why my family still lives in the camps, because today Palestinian refugees are denied the right of return. Um, and so for me, when I'm telling the story, it's important to contextualize that. So the first thing I did in the book is give this intro and this background um, to explain why my family's in this position and how we got there. Um, also throughout the book, I used a lot of um, these patterns. Um, you can see them on the cover. Um, um, you can see them on the cover, you can see them here, they're integrated throughout the book. Um, these patterns are taken from traditional types of Palestinian embroidery. Um, and so there were a lot of um, incorporating images from the embroidery, incorporating stories about um, stuff like zata, which is a common like spice that you use in Palestinian cooking. Um, incorporating stuff like that was also a very intentional choice for me in order to resist um, cultural appropriation. So part of Israel's ethnic cleansing is not only limited to like forcing Palestinians from the land, it also extends to actually like claiming aspects of Palestinian culture. So like one time my roommate came back from Whole Foods with a little tub that said Israeli Zaka on it. And I was like, <coughs> you know better than this. Like why did you buy this? Why did you bring this into the house? I can't, like just don't. Um, or like you'll see um, Israeli designers using this pattern from this Palestinian scarf, like, in fashion lines on the runway and saying, oh, it's an, Israeli, it's an Israeli scarf, erasing the fact that this is a Palestinian Arab scarf with a long history, um, first used by farmers, then politicized and used by freedom fighters, so there's a long political and cultural history behind this scarf. Israel just erases that. Same with our um, Salfis, the, the embroidery patterns, taking those and incorporating them into Israeli fashion and saying this is an Israeli thing. So um, part of 
really strategically, the way I was telling the story was trying to include um, stories and anecdotes and narratives that incorporated aspects of our culture and explain them for people. So that when people see this thing, they can associate it with Palestinians after having read the book. And then if they see appropriation happening, it's not erasure anymore. You can recognize it as erasure. You can say, oh, this is a Palestinian thing, and they're saying it's Israeli. Interesting. Um, so all of that kind of stuff, um, without talking ex explicitly about cultural appropriation, can impact the reader and influence them in the future. Um, another thing that I was really intentional about was not incorporating any kind of Zionist rhetoric into um, the framing of the story, whether that was visually or um, through, like verbally, through the words. So when you're creating a comic, when you're creating a graphic novel, the words and the images have to go together like this to tell the story. It's not like you have a picture and then the words are telling the story or something like that. It's both of them working together equally to, to bring the reader along and, and bring them through the narrative. Um, and so uh, when I was writing the, the graphic novel, I was thinking really intentionally about not reproducing um, Zionist rhetoric in the storytelling. So for example, um, a lot of times in uh, news articles or something like that, you might see something like, um, X number of Palestinians died. Who killed them? <laughs> so that, that's a very subtle way that Zionist rhetoric can um, subconsciously impact the reader. Um, and we replicate it sometimes. Like even I, when I was going through and editing the book, was realizing, oh, I'm replicating, because there are these very subtle like phrases or terms that you see used in the news, and then you replicate them when you're doing your own writing without even realizing it. So I was really, really careful throughout writing the story to make sure that I wasn't doing that, that I wasn't subconsciously taking the blame away from um, from Israel. So even if I'm talking about when my family was ethnically cleansed, if you say Palestinians left Palestine, that is kind of a more passive, you know, it, it takes away the responsibility from Israel. So you have to explain why did those people leave? What what caused that to happen? It's not like people just left for fun. Um, so just as I was thinking really, really carefully about the types of verbiage I was using and the words I was using to describe the historical events, I was also thinking really intentionally about visually how am I going to also um, stay true to like a, a Palestinian narrative. Not that there's one Palestinian narrative, there's not, but my family's narrative. And so one of the things that I decided to do was to actually never draw the face of the oppressor. Um, and I do this throughout my work. Um, there's other examples of it. Um, I'll talk about these in a minute. Um, but not drawing the face of the oppressor was really important to me because there's a huge double standard when it comes to arts and media created specifically by Palestinians, um, but other people, uh, minorities in, uh, in general. Um, basically that we're seen as inherently unbalanced and in order for our narrative to be credible, we have to include the other side and a balanced perspective. Um, and when I'm talking about my dad's experiences, when I'm talking about his experiences growing up, like. Art Spiegelman would never be expected in his story about his father's experience to, to show the other side for balance. That would just be ridiculous. So the same for me. When I'm telling my father's story, I decided very consciously at the beginning of the process, this is my dad's story. Um, this is a personal narrative for my family. And I it is not my obligation to tell the story of the oppressor. I don't have to give them space in this narrative. They have other spaces, they have other places. I don't know if any of you have seen the film Waltz with Bashir. Um, it's an animation film about a massacre of a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon during the Civil War. And it's kind of like this Israeli who participated in it, and he's so tortured, and he's so sad that I hate that movie because for me, I don't care how sad the soldier is, I care what happened to the Palestinians. What about those families? What about those families who are impacted? We don't hear those stories. And for me, it was a very conscious decision of like, I'm telling Palestinian stories. Someone else can do that. Um, I don't need to put energy into that. Um, and actually, the only time that somebody challenged me on this, it was interesting, um, was when I was giving a talk in Palestine. So uh, I was there for the Palestine Festival of Literature, and I was giving a talk at Bethlehem University, and there was a Palestinian man in the audience well, there were, the audience was all Palestinians, basically. But after, during the Q&A, 
um, this man was like, um, basically why, you know, I don't agree with you not drawing the face of the oppressor, um, because it absolves them of responsibility. These are real individual people who are committing these horrific acts, and we have to hold them individually accountable. And for me, I was like, that may be true, but that's not what I'm interested in exploring. That's not what my role is. I'm not here to psychoanalyze and deconstruct and understand the oppressor. I'm here to tell my people's stories. And um, so this character, Handala, so this character, I basically related my answer to this character, Handala. So I'm gonna explain who this character is. Um, Handala is a cartoon character created by a Palestinian political cartoonist named Naji Al Ali. Um, this is one of Naji Al Ali's political cartoons. Um, and you can see this character, he's always standing in kind of to the side, usually sometimes in the background of these political cartoons. And you always see him with his back to the viewer and his hands behind his back, just the way he's standing now. Sometimes he's doing stuff, but most of the time he has his hands behind his back. Um, and this character is extremely well known in Palestine, like, um, He's on graffiti. I have a keychain of him on my like, you know, there's like objects like you can buy like I don't know keychains and all this kind of like kitschy stuff with his image on it. He's everywhere. Everybody recognizes him. And Naji Al Ali was creating comics during the time of the Civil War. He himself was a Palestinian refugee living in Lebanon at the time. Um, and actually, I referenced a lot of his um, images when I was doing research for my book as almost like a primary source, like a window into how Palestinians at the time were processing and responding to political events that were unfolding. Um, and so this character, Handala, the, the story behind him is basically that you will never, the, the reader will never see his face and he will never turn around um, until Palestinian refugees are allowed to go back to our villages, until we're allowed to go back to the lands we were ethnically cleansed from in 1948. Um, and so I told him, you know, we've never seen Handala's face. We never see it. I'm interested in his face. I want to explore his story. What is his story? Why don't we ever see his face? I want to explore many faces of Handala through exploring many different Palestinian experiences. I'm not interested in the oppressor story right now. It's everywhere. We have enough of it. It's time for us to tell our stories. Um, and so that was kind of my answer to that. Um, and I do reference this character throughout and actually you can see on the cover, this is a direct reference to that character, directly referencing my father as another Handala, another Palestinian refugee. And these are the types of symbols I would use throughout the book um, that might be recognizable to Palestinians or people who know more about it. So like sometimes Palestinians will be like, oh, is that is that Handala? Like is, you know, they'll recognize it immediately. If you didn't know about that history, you might not recognize it but you might learn about it through the book. And then maybe, so there's a lot of symbols like that throughout the book where I kind of put in extra layers of meaning for people who might be more familiar with, with those types of symbols and histories, but I really wanted to make sure to create a story that would not shut out people who wouldn't recognize those symbols, that it was still a story that people reading it would be able to learn more about our history and the context um, and all that stuff through the story. So I was kind of thinking about both when I was working on it. Um, so. All of it for me has been really strategic. Like everything about the way I frame the story, what types of symbols I'm using, um, what types of words and images I'm using, it's all about framing and messaging for me and, and subtly, not hitting people over the head with the politics, but subtly influencing people's understanding of the history. Um, because people engage more easily when they don't feel like they're being preached to, obviously. But everything is political for me. And so you can't, uh, separate something from the political context um, and you don't always want to hit people over the head with it but you definitely want to be aware of it and to me as a person who is creating work that's Palestinian that's often getting led into like alternative comics and zine spaces where there aren't many other Arabs or Palestinians if any um, and like when we find each other we're like oh my god and I give them everything for free I'm like this stuff is free for Palestinians you don't have to pay for anything <laughs> I made it for you take it um, but uh, so um, you know even if you don't want to be like the spokesperson for your people you end up being forced into that position whether you like it or not and for me Instead of ignoring it, I decided, okay, I have to be really conscious of that, and I have to act and create in a responsible way. Um, 
and actually this was another argument that I got into. I always, I never get into arguments here, like, I only get into arguments when I present in the Middle East, but like, there was this whole debate when I was presenting at the American University of Beirut, there was a comic symposium, and there was a big argument about, um, do we have to tell our story, can we tell our stories truthfully, or do we have to cater it for a white audience so as to not, like, represent our people badly for that way. You know, can't I tell, can't I talk honestly about how my teacher hit me without worrying about, you know, making all Arabs look bad? And it was kind of a debate about like, well, can we do both? Like, um, is it irresponsible to just like not contextualize those types of things for people? Um, so these kinds of issues come up a lot. Um, so, like I said, um, there are certain visual things that I replicate in a lot of my work. Um, this was a zine. These are images from a zine I created after I got back from Palestine, the Palestine, um, uh, what's it called, Festival of Literature that I went on. So, again, visually portraying the experiences that I had, putting those comics online, putting those zines, the content of those zines online, um, so that people could access them, but then also giving people an opportunity to buy them if they wanted to support the work. Um, because for me, it's really important to have these materials online, um, which is, you know, even after the book was published, I was insistent with my author, that, uh, with my publisher, that I wanted to keep a few of the anecdotes online. Um, because for me, access is really important. I'm telling these stories so that people can learn more about um, our history and our struggle, and so I didn't want to kind of limit who could access that. Um, so I wanted both print that can be physically distributed and also online so that people can access it for free. Um, and these are a couple more examples of like posters I've done. Um, again, like thinking strategically about how these are going to be distributed. So these are both posters that I made. I didn't sign them. I often don't sign stuff like this and give to people to reproduce in their own context for their own political purposes. So for me, again, um, distribution is really important. And whether I'm illustrating like Israelis or whether um, this is a poster about um, Palestinian repression, so uh, how the Palestinian Authority participates in security coordination with Israel and participates in the repression of other Palestinians. So whether that oppressor is Israeli or whether that oppressor is Palestinians cooperating with Israeli and Zionist forces, I don't draw the faces. Um, and same with this, like if you're looking at this within the context of the story, these would be more of like um, Lebanese soldiers, Maronite um, Lebanese militias that were oppressing Palestinians at the time. So regardless of who that who that oppressor is. Um, and this is another image from that series. Um, again, it kind of has a face, but it I had originally drawn it with an eye, but I took the eye out because I thought it was too humanizing. So just um, sort of an intentionally <laughs> <laughs> dehumanization because we have been systematically dehumanized for so long. And I, Open me with that. Um, so again, yeah, a reference to Handala. Um, and this was another comic that I made again as a zine after I had um, already published Badawi. So, like I said, after I published the book, I started getting more into zines and smaller comics and self publishing because although I had a book published by a publisher, I still believe that. We don't need permission to speak. When I started telling my father's stories, I was just posting them online. I didn't ask for someone to lift up my story. I didn't ask for permission. Um, and so for me, that is still very important. Like I believe that we can still tell our stories and disseminate this information independently. If someone wants to circulate it more widely, that's cool. But like we don't need that permission to tell our narratives. Um, because often we're denied that permission. And I'll get into that a little more, and others have already spoken on it. Um, but this was a short comic I did about two men from Gaza who came into the United States. Um, they actually traveled from Gaza. They flew to Venezuela, I think, and they traveled all through Central America on foot, on, on land, in buses. They got to the U.S.-Mexico border. They were like, hey, we're from Gaza. Here are our documents. We're seeking asylum in the United States. And they were put in an ICE detention center. And people did, activists did not find out that they were in there until they had been there for almost a year. And the United States would not deport them because the United States does not re recognize the government of Gaza. They consider the government in Gaza to be a terrorist organization. They don't recognize the Palestinian government. Um, so in order to deport them back to Palestine, they would have to recognize the Palestinian government. So they couldn't deport them. 
but they also didn't want to let them into the country and grant them asylum. So they were indefinitely just detained in an ICE detention center. And so some activists were trying to get them out. They were like, hey, we can't take photos of them because they're in the center, but can you draw a logo for them? You know, we have a petition going around. And um, after coordinating with the organizers out there more, I ended up actually going there to Arizona, um, interviewing them in the detention center, um, going to see like where they had crossed the US-Mexico border. Um, and I created this scene, comic scene, to kind of explain to people what had happened to them. And again, I, for me, comics are a really good way to engage people in subject matter that they might otherwise be alienated from, or engage people in a story that they might otherwise be like, ooh, too political. Um, you know, to whatever, this is this is not for me. But through the medium of comics, I find that you can really engage people. And so um, that, for me, was really effective with Badawi, and so I tried it again for this. Um, and the story was published online in like a Palestinian magazine. It circulated um, elsewhere. We had also printed out copies and were selling them to raise money for their bonded resettlement fund. And after a lot of pressure and public pressure and more and more media coverage over time, um, actually both of them were released from the detention center. They were not granted asylum, but the US also won't deport them. So they're living in the United States now and they both have work permits. Um, and they just have to like, check in with ICE every now and then, um, which can be scary under Trump's administration. We had a bit of a scare with it earlier this year. Um, but so far, so good, sort of. Like they're still, you know, they're not in a prison anymore, which is amazing. Um, so, like I said, always thinking really, really intentionally about how I can use my work to actually plug into and be useful to campaigns. How can I use this to, like, raise awareness about an issue, or to raise money, or to be, um, like with those posters um, that I had showed you, like, to be useful to people in a campaign, where they can print it, they can reproduce it, it's not only mine, it belongs to other people, and other people can use it how they need to use it. Um, so for me, that's extremely important. and. Um, I always think of art as like, how can it be useful? How can it be integrated into a campaign or into organizing? Um, and that goes for comics as well. Um, so now I have this um, new project that I'm working on. Um, it was mentioned, it's called Big Mouth Comics. Um, so it kind of came out of having access to a lot of spaces because I had written a book. Um, and being in those spaces and being like, like I said, like there's not many more of us here. Like. Um, a lot of comics and DIY spaces, scene spaces, the expos I was tabling at, um, it would be weird because they're supposedly all about DIY and you know, self-publishing and stuff like that, but because I had a book that was published, I was treated like, whoa, special guest, like this person with a published book and like, um, you know, I was like, it was cool because I was like, awesome, I can like talk to people about Palestine, <laughs> which again, it's always strategic for me, like this is, I want to use this as a vehicle to talk to people about Palestine, but, um, but also it was like one time I was tabling next to some people who were like, oh, we're from Finland and here's our zine about a Palestine, here's a comic about a Syrian refugee family. And like really talking, you know, it's like a hot topic now. And, and I was like, cool, wish there were more of us telling our own stories here. Like instead of people just seeing that this is a hot topic and deciding that it's important. And you know what I mean? Like what about when we tell our own stories? There weren't very many people of color, um, especially not like people from the Middle East. And so um, now I'm working on this distro project. Um, basically trying to distribute work made by, um, I kind of wanted to keep it really broad, um, because in the US, often um, people from like what we call the MMSA region, like um, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, South Asian and Muslim countries, often get turned into a monolith. It's like, or like, like you see that with like sick people being attacked because people think they're Muslim, or like something like that. Like oftentimes we're turned into a monolith and we're, attacked or targeted mistakenly or uh, not mistakenly because they're meaning to, you know, but uh, there's basically a lack of understanding and a lack of our own voices, which goes back to why I started drawing the Dowie in the first place, because there was a lack of our voices and a lack of our narratives. Um, and so I basically created this distro um, 
to kind of break down those barriers. And um, I really liked what you said um, earlier about like if you have a door open for you, like bring other people through the door. And for me, I was like, I want to bring more people through this door. I want to like get more. So that's why I started the distro in order to like, okay, if I'm gonna get a table, like when I tabled at Cake last year, they gave me like a table right in the front. You know, like before you even go in, like there's like a few big distros or something and then my table and I was like, I want other people's work on this table, not just mine. I want all of our voices and all of its multiplicities, all of its complexities on this table. Um, and so uh, I've been uh, kind of starting to curate and bring in um, some other artists to the distro. Um, and have it also be inclusive of artists working outside the United States. So comics artists who um, are working in their home countries. Um, a lot of people don't know, but there's huge comic scenes in the Middle East right now. These are just a few. Um, so there's a huge Cairo Comics Festival that happens every year. It brings together like Arab and Middle Eastern comics makers from all over the Middle East to Cairo. It's a huge convention, people tabling stuff and um, small presses. There's a lot of small um, comics anthologies. So Samandal comes out of Lebanon. Skepkep comes out of Morocco. Tuk Tuk comes out of Egypt. There's all these comics anthologies and like um, uh, uh, you know movements and, and art scenes all throughout the Middle East that people here just aren't aware of. And so um, part of my interest uh, after being in Lebanon. Uh, and you know, meeting with artists there was like, okay, I started to think about my work as like, I don't have to explain myself all the time. I don't have to explain myself to Americans all the time in my work. A lot of times when you look at, and a lot of the work that I distro that's made by um, Arab American artists is like, there's one, the title is I am not a terrorist. There's another, you know, there's so much energy spent into like explaining ourselves and explaining our histories and like, trying to justify ourselves or give people a 101 about what it means to be Arab or what it means to be Palestinian. And it really limits the types of work we can do. It limits the types of stories we can tell. Um, and so for me, um, being in Lebanon and like connecting with other, other Middle Eastern artists, I was like, awesome. I don't have to think of my work in that way anymore. I can be in conversation with other Arab artists around the world. We can all be in conversation with each other. And so that's another goal of the distro is to like bring together all these voices so that we can see our work not in the context of like us versus white tablers at the Zine Expo, but like us amongst ourselves having conversations. What does it mean? How is it different to be Palestinian in the US versus being Palestinian in the camps in Lebanon versus being Palestinian in the West Bank or in Gaza? Those are so many different experiences of being Palestinian. Um, what does it mean to like be an Arab living in diaspora versus living at, you know, at home or dealing with war directly versus indirectly? Like, all of these are conversations that can be teased out, but that we don't often have the opportunity to engage in because either there is like uh, linguistic barriers or just like physical barriers that prevent us from being together. Um, and so that's part of the goal of the distro as well is to like bring all those voices together to have to allow us to have more nuanced conversations in our working with each other. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to end on. Um, thinking about just, my work is always strategic. It's never like, it's, I put a lot of thought both into like the framing of the way I frame my narratives and also like why I'm doing everything. There's always like a reason behind it and it's, a lot of it is around like changing narratives or um, how it can plug into a campaign or something like that. Um, and for me, I always want to be aware of those things, but still not let it dictate necessarily. Like, I don't want to be fighting stereotypes in my work all the time. I don't want it to dictate what I'm doing, but I want to have it in the back of my mind so it can inform my work um, to do things in a more powerful or um, uh, strategic way. Um, and so that's just kind of what I want. So one of the things that we've both been asked already, um, what other texts would you recommend? I, I cannot remember her name. Um, there's a Palestinian author, she wrote um, In Search of Fatima mm -hmm. and The Return. But there's a ton, like what would you yeah. recommend like, to, to us to read For in any medium? What are you saying, Nadine? 
Got yes, it's got a something, and I can't remember. It starts with an R, I think. And I don't. Yeah. yeah I, I mean that that it's was like a famous company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're great. Um, but I mean the other ones too. I mean I get asked this in conversion, so I get yeah. asked all the time like yeah. what movies, what comics. Yeah. But, um, specifically about Palestinian stuff, or just in general. I guess about, about Palestinians, because yeah. um, the one that everybody knows is Joe Sacco's Palestine. Right, exactly, <laughs> and it's like, you know, people ask me about that a lot, and I'm like, Joe Sacco, like, I feel like, I appreciate the depth of research that goes into it, but when I'm looking at his drawings, I literally feel like I put on, like, white lens glasses, and I'm, like, looking at my people the way, like, like somebody else, like, orientalizes them, or, like, visually, just, like, I'm like, whoa, this is weird. Like, I feel like you're caricaturing my people. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to think. It's hard with comics, because it's still really up and coming. Um, there's a few comics artists, so there's Marguerite Debye, um, who does like small mini comics and stuff like that, um, similar vein. Um, there's, uh, I'm thinking more broadly, there's actually a Lebanese artist I really want to recommend. Her name, her name is Zaina Abiyamshin. Um, and she does, she's not Palestinian, she's Lebanese, but she does absolutely beautiful graphic novels about the Civil War in Lebanon. Um, and those are um, available in French and English. Um, 